Right, good afternoon everyone. Hello and uh, welcome. Um, today's uh, What If session is going to be about interviewing police groups. And my name is Neil Perkins, I'm from HIPPO, which is the Health Policy Politics Organisation Group in the Institute of Primary Care. And, um, I've been interviewing what could be termed elite groups of people for quite a number of years now um, for a variety of studies. So I hope today just to give you some insight, um, hope to give you some insight into, into what that entails and the barriers that you may come across, etc. And the opportunities as well. So, just to put that in context, what I'm going to be covering in today's session is first of all, hi everyone, come in. So what I'm going to be covering in today's session um, is first of all defining elites, what do we mean by elites, then getting your foot in the door, actually getting to actually interview these people, and then getting your sample, uh, which is the other one that I want, the interview itself, um, techniques for interviewing elites, and difficult interviewing this because Sometimes it ain't plain sailing, folks. And you know, you'll get some people who can be a bit difficult. And so we'll chat about that. And then we'll talk about post interview and then some wrap up with just some conclusions. And just at the top there, it's estimated that 90% of all social science investigations use interviews uh, of some sort. Um, the contribution of the interview to research and knowledge is therefore quite a substantial one, obviously. Um, Morris uh, noted that there's books on research methodology and they, they cover all the domains, you know, and chapters on how to do interviews, how to do focus groups, but there's very little actually on interviewing lead groups. Um, very little indeed. Um, and Welsh argued that until recently our understanding of some of the methodological challenges of researching elites has lagged behind our rush to interview them. Um, so there's been scant guidance really in the theoretical literature about how to prepare um, to interview elite subjects and what type of challenges to expect. And um, you know the challenges and the, and the strategies are important because um, Schoenberg uh, argues, says that these are very powerful and self-assured people talking more or less of an obscure academic who pose so far as they're concerned, absolutely no threat. Let's put it in other terms, your toast. So, basically, you're an obscure academic and you pose no threat, is, is what John Lowe argues. Um, but before we go rushing into interviewing the leads, let's, let's have a look at what we're talking about now. I mean, and, and Rice notes that, you know, with elites, there's there's an array of definitions, and Rice says as a social group, as individuals are linked to be the focus of definitional scholars that vary across a range of literatures. And that's pretty much true. Um, and, you know, Morris, for instance, argues that elites are those with close proximity to power. Uh, Burnham argues that elites are those with particular expertise. Um, it can include corporate, political, professional elites, you know. Etc., such and medics, etc. So, there's different categories of what we mean by elite. And as Harvey notes, there's no clear cut definition of the term elite. There's no real clear cut definition. And Smith, in a very interesting piece of work, argues that the factors that researchers have used to signify elite varies greatly from context to context. And this is important as well, really, because in studies, um, you know, the focus could be on people with elite form of knowledge. Uh, focus on professionals working in prestigious financial institutions. You've got Sabat and Cochrane use elites who signify holding positions of political authority. And in us, STEM just, you know, so it says that elites you know, are stemming from the control of resources. So there's all different definitions of elites out there. Uh, people you know, argue that there is different definitions. But there is things that sort of bind them together, if you like. And um, I mean, Harvey, for instance, argues that it's people with different, you know, who are controlled different social networks, etc. You know, and, and because of that, they have, you know, 
elite knowledge uh, because they have access to elite people, other elites, etc. And it's those networks that bring them the power. So there's different definitions. So what I want to try and do is look at all, I've been looking at all these different definitions. Let's, just for today, have a working de definition of elites. So it's the person who occupies senior management and board level positions. Um, they have strategic responsibilities for important areas of work and oversee strategic direction of the organisation and the key influential, influential decision makers. And um, obviously considerable knowledge and experience and as a broad network of relationships and, and as I said, those power, that power may come from those relationships. So, now we've got a working handle on what we're talking about. You want, to, you want to actually get to interview these people. Um, just a couple of quick words about you know, sampling here. And there's, there's you know, a couple of methods. Uh, purpose of sampling is a selection method where the study's purpose and the researcher's knowledge of the population guide the process. Um, so if the study entails interviewing a predefined visible set of actors, in this case elites, the research may be in a position to identify particular respondents of interest and sample those deemed appropriate. And an example here, I guess, would be, say for instance, market researchers who stand on busy streets and seek to question passers-by, and often they have a specific target group in mind and will try to interview people with a certain age, race, gender, etc. You know, so sometimes you, think, you, you walk across these people, they're not interested in you because you're not their target set. Then, um, so that's one way of doing it. Another way is, is, is snowball or chain of referral sampling. And this is the most, pretty much, when it comes to interviewing elites, the most popular method. Um, and one of the most well known forms of non probability sampling is snowball sampling. Um, so this is useful where the population interest is not fully visible. And you will find this with elites sometimes is that. You know, you'll go up for an initial, say you're looking for a particular organisation or you're looking, say, for a clinical commissioning group, you're looking for a local authority, and it's people, you know, at the top you want to interview. And, you know, you can perhaps go on the internet and blank. I was trying to get hold of a consultant in public health for one study. They didn't exist. No, they literally didn't exist on the internet. They weren't there. Their name wasn't there. Nothing. They literally didn't exist. So, you use a snowball method. Is where you get people in the organisation. Oh, you're on about. Well, they are, no, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you the contact detail. You snow. But there is a bit of a danger with this. Is that is that your sampling respondents often suggest that those who share those similar characteristics or the same outlook. So you've got to be a bit careful. Um, so you've got to really ensure that your initial set of respondents is, is sufficiently diverse, so the sample isn't skewed in one direction. You're not being led down a certain path, you know. Depends on the context of the study, really. And suffice to say, I always have back up interviews as well. So you got to a position where you know who you want to interview, you know how you're going to get hold of them. How do you get your foot in the door? That's the question. A lot of this is common sense, obviously. Um, the location and the length of the interview is important. You know, you're not going to go and ask for a two or three hour interview because you just won't get it. You know, you'll be lucky if you get an hour. Um, and then settle for a half hour if you have to. Um, and as I say, the usual thing is initially looking on websites, etc., etc., to try and get people's contact details. Uh, look for gatekeepers who will come to in a minute to find out who to talk to. And of course, the other obvious thing is some people are better at contacting at certain times than others. Yeah? So don't contact politicians before an election or finance people at the end of the financial year. <laughs> Back at the March, it's not a good time to talk to them people. Um, you know, things like that. Um, also, if the policy you're looking at area is new or a bit politically sensitive, that can also, you know, affect the access because people will not want to talk. Uh, it, it, when it comes to ro rolling out new policies, people are like, hmm, they don't want to be really talking about it. So, them things you've got to bear in mind. Yeah? Of course, an initial email, 
a letter, if you want to be old fashioned, uh, spell out the basics of your research, who you are, where you're from, what's the nature of the research, why it's important to them, and be clear about the amount of time you're, you're wanting, and be, but be flexible, yeah? Um, make sure you've got all your contact details, the letter should be clear about the ground rules for who the, uh, you know, uh, for the interview, you know, um, how will the information be gathered, uh, how will it be used, how will it be reported, where will it appear, for instance, is it part of PFD, is it for like a, 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 a research study or whatever, will it be recorded, if so, stress the confidentiality and anonymity for, uh, for their organisation, what steps will be taken to keep the sensitive information confidential, how the research will be disseminated, um, uh, so you know, you're willing to send any articles or etc. any findings, and um, make sure you compose it with no academic jargon. People have been reading it again. What? <coughs> All right. So, follow up email, if no response, and then a call to the PA, etc. Remember, these people, these people are busy, don't expect. I mean, I've got plenty of colleagues here who <laughs> stagely know. Don't expect an instant response. You will be chasing people up. I'm chasing them up. I'm chasing them up in some cases. I'm not trying to put you off, it's just how it is. Why is that? Why do we have to chase these people up? What's stopping us just going in there and interviewing these very important people? Unhindered. Uncumbered. Gatekeepers, that's your problem. That sounds scary enough to do that. Gatekeepers. It's not scary. Right, gatekeepers. Well, these can be your BFF or your West Ranger, depending on the individual. Gatekeepers, also known as PAs, executive assistants, appointment secretaries, etc., etc. And these people can make your life so easy or make your life really difficult. Um, and Harvey notes that researchers should be well prepared to summarise the research briefly, as I said in academic, academic jargon, and to these people. But don't be put off, yeah? The thing, the thing I would always say is don't be put off by gatekeepers, and their role is to protect the interests of their company, or their organisation, or their NHS trust, or whatever. And these people often make the decisions of whether someone should speak to the elites or not. And in most cases, they have complete access and control of their diaries. You are in there. Simply put. Uh, and they can literally unlock the door to other elites. So you've got to, extra, you've got to really stress the what's in it with them angle, you know. And uh, why the research is very important and, and crucially important that you speak to these people. Because if you didn't, it's the end of civilization as we know it. Something like that. So just, you know, stress that the research is important, that your research is important. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of um, academics, you know, uh, because has argued that gaining access to elites, is, you, it's got to be carefully negotiated and it can take much longer and at higher cost, you know, getting access to these people. Let me give you a few instances, right? So, the prior life I worked at Durham University and was doing story. I need to speak to this director of public health. And I got the executive assistant to the public health uh, director. And if I had a pound for every email and every phone call I made, I'd be rich. I think I was eight months. Eight months trying to get hold of this director of public health. Eight months. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've spoken to them, they'll get back to you. Yeah, yeah, no problem, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got your email, yeah, no problem, they'll suck, yes. We'll, 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 I'll get back to you with some dates, yes. And of course, you just, obviously, you've got, you're a professional. You know, so you're just polite and courteous, etc. Thank you, thank you very much for your time, etc. So you're thinking, how did I break this impasse? I got lucky. I ran one day just before lunch, the executive assistant of the conference, you'll pick up the phone from the director of public health. What study is that like? Oh, yeah, well, you, you, you sent us a letter asking you know, permission to conduct the study months ago. Why haven't you been in touch? Mm -hmm. 
set from Mechie Life, or you get other people who are just brilliant. You know, or just say, oh yes, sort it out for you, boom, 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 boom. And within like a, a couple of days, you know, you've got all your contacts. It really does vary. It varies, you know. There's, there's no, um, there's no hard and fast rules of it. It really does, you know, it varies on the individual. So, pre-interview. Some people might ask for a copy of the interview schedule or a topic guide because they want to know what you're going to be asking them. Um, so you might get that, Kerry. Some people say, send, you know, send through or email a copy of your interview schedule or your topic guide. Um, yeah, I mean, it goes without saying, you know, you guys smart, you know, you've got to tell the teacher and dreams, you know, if you, you know, in that case. Um, um, talk about turning up. I mean, for any interviews, email or, or ring the day before, check it's still on. I know myself and my colleagues have lovely instances in the past where it's, uh, well, we left, a, we left a message on your phone uh, at your office, but, uh, you know, sort of like, yes, well, I was halfway to London at that point. <laughs> you know, so do check, because, as I said, these are busy people, and it can just change like that, so please check. Um... The other thing is, find out how much time you have. I'll tell you why. I mean, I think there's lots of instances I've got there. I mean, there's, a, there's a study I'm currently working on, and I went to interview uh, an NHS type person, and I booked to the interview for an hour, and I got in there, and I said, Right, you've got 20 minutes. So be prepared to have in your mind those questions you really want to answer. Because you're going to turn up and say, oh no, I've got another meeting, I've just been rescheduled, and sorry, you've got 20 minutes, or you've got half an hour, or whatever. So be prepared for that, because it, it may have happened. Um, so you've really got to think in advance about the questions you want to ask. So you've got your interview booked, you've got your date and time, your venue, you're all arranged. Guess what? You just got cancelled, which is probably. These people are busy. You, you be prepared to be cancelled. Again, on, on, on a study we were working on, I think it's five times my interviews have been arranged recently. Be prepared, you know, to get it rescheduled and rescheduled. These people are busy, you know, you're not exactly going to be sometimes top of the list. So just bear in mind that you might get rescheduled sometimes. Um, do your homework. I can't stress this enough. Do your homework. Find out all you can about the individual and the organisation in advance. And any, I mean, th this next bit is difficult, but if you, if you can tease out any issues currently going on in the organisation, there might be a, being around the redundancies, etc., whatever. Um, and also remember that elites are the queens and kings of acronyms, ladies and gentlemen. They will come out with more <laughs> acronyms than you can shake several sticks at. And, you know, you've really, unless you want to look rather silly, you know, you've got to know what these things mean. Um, so that's, that's another thing I, I would say to you. And um, some elites presume you know about the organisational structure, the main programmes and schemes of work they've got under the way of the organisation, who the key players are. And you must show you've done your own work because often elites consciously or subconsciously challenge, will challenge you on, on the subject and, and its relevance and demonstrate that you know about their organisation and you know what they're doing and what a brilliant job they're doing, etc. You know, this policy is rather wonderful, isn't it? Um, so, and it's also a, a, a good defence, as we'll come on to in a minute, against, you know, <laughs> just people just patronising it. Um... Which leads us to the interview itself. Context and setting are important, obviously. I mean, usually it'll take place in, in, in their office. Um, make sure you get permission to record the interview, and I stress, you know, stress confidentiality because this, this, you know, and the, the findings will be anonymised, or, or, or if not, why not? So, you know. They can't be attributable, so they can basically say what they want. They're free to talk freely in the interview. Um, and this really helps put people at their ease, because at least we're the guardian in the comments about concerns over anonymity, etc. So, you know, quotes attributed to them, etc. Um, 
Well, she makes a, a good point, and she says that elite subjects may easily dominate the interview because they are professional communicators, and they are generally. Um, used to addressing a wide range of audiences and developing elaborate and persuasive arguments. In this situation, the researcher is at risk of being patronised, as I just mentioned. And makes an interesting point as well, who says, as a result, researchers may dis display a form of hostage syndrome uh, by suspending their judgement in face of an elite's display of power, and the risk overestimating the importance of what elites have to say. And sometimes, you know, you might be just so glad to get the interview <laughs> that, you know, you'll just... You're not, going to, you're not going to go in there and, 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 and ask any challenging, too challenging questions. Don't, basically. Um, you know what you've got to ask them, so ask them. Um, and sometimes the elite interviewer, you know, they might try and turn the tables and the interviewer becomes the interviewee. And I said, don't let it happen. You know, stand your ground, don't be intimidated. It's your research, you're the one asking the questions, remember? You know, but some people may try and turn the conversation more to their advantage, yeah? Remember, these people are skilled communicators. So, you know, just, just ask the questions you want to ask. So they might try and dictate the interview. Um, and here's an interesting thing. When I say here, be yourself and don't play a role. Harvey argues that you have to gauge how to conduct the interview very quickly. And there's an interesting paper by McDowell who found herself shifting, uh, he says here to quote Harvey, found herself shifting their position, including playing dumb uh, with older patriarchal figures, brusquely efficient with fierce older women, their words, not mine, and sisterly with women of the same age holding similar positions and super fast and well informed with younger men. I think this is the, sorry but no, no. Be yourself, don't play the role, just be yourself. Because these people, they deal with politicians and etc. all the time. <laughs> they can see that if I said, well, you know, they know when you know, you're playing a role. So don't do it, um, it would be my advice. Um, effective interviewers, I would argue, and a number of others have argued, um, the, the people who, who make it a conversation. You know, um, and it's much more productive, you know, because uh, otherwise it, people will, cl will clam up. So you've got to make the interview a conversation. And there's a lovely quote here um, by Berry, who says, The best interviewer is not one who writes the best questions, rather excellent interviewers are excellent conversationalists. They will make interviews seem like a good talk among old friends. And he, he talks here of his mentor, and he said he didn't carry a printed set of questions in front of him to consult as the interview progressed. He, he always knew where he was going, never lost control of the discussion. He gave his subjects a lot of license to roam, but occasionally corralled them back if the discussion went too far astray. Um, and I, I, I would concur with that, absolutely. Um, you, you make it a discussion, don't make it an interview. Because if, if you make it feel like an interview, they know it feels like an interview, and they will be on guard, yeah? Try and make it a discussion, try and make a conversation. <coughs> so, for instance, uh, your interview schedule, your topic guide, memorise it as much as you can. Because the last thing you want to be doing is, can I ask you the next question, which is, you know, it, it, you know have it memorised, because it will feel like an interview. Yeah, you don't want it to feel like an interview because otherwise people will be more, more, more open you know, if, if, if you memorise your topic guide. Um, so it's more like a conversation, less like an interview. Um, and you know, if you've got, you got it right in front of you all the time, you know, it looks as though you don't know, you don't know what questions you're going to ask. You, know, you do, of course. It's just, you know, just have it by your side. I've got it. You know. um, because if you're calm and relaxed, they'll be. Simple. Um, elites also may give, and this is a thing you've got to watch for, um, they may give a corporate view rather than their own personal view. Yeah? They'll give the organisation's view, and it's not common um, for researchers to hear a public relations version of events instead of the person's own accounts of events. Um, 
And Thomas suggests that presenting the questions in personal terms and showing an interest in what the person they think tends to open up you know, the interviews. My take on that is again, just look at the conversation as much as you can. Yeah. Um, elites tend not to like close questions with a yes no response. They tend to like uh, articulate the views and not be constricted by just very definitive yes no answers. So when, you, when you're constructing your topic or your interview schedule, Avoid too many straight yes-no questions. Um, and it also restricts any good, good data you might get as well, actually. Which then leads us on to the other extreme, which is open-ended questioning. And Barry notes that open-ended questioning is the riskiest but most potentially valuable type of elite viewing. And it requires interviewers to know when to probe and how to formulate follow-up questions on the fly. And it's a bit of a high wire act, really. Um, for instance, let me give you an example. You might be discussing a policy area that isn't covering your topic guard, a really current hot policy area. So, for instance, in one of the studies we've <coughs> currently what there's something called better care fund, you know, but you know, it was very important to other areas of, of our work. So you might put in a question about that. You know? Although it's not your topic guard. Oh you might just or they might just say something. You think, oh wow, this now that's interesting. <laughs> So you're going to pursue it, and you're right to pursue it. The question is, is when you, what, you've got to crawl it back and get back to you know, your main list of, 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 of questions and topics you want to discuss. Um, so some pros may take you down some unexpected paths, but potentially rewarding ones, and the trick is knowing when to stick to the topic or your interview schedule or not. And of course, you'll have pros in your, in, in your interview schedule or topic guard, you know, but as I said, there's ones you might do off the cuff. Um, create a dis set of decision rules in your head as well if time begins to run out and what you're going to focus on. Um, topic guards tend to follow logical flows of, of topics rather than a rank of priorities. And this is this thing about a conversational approach again and having that topic guard in your head. Because in interviews, you, say you've got like a topic guard, I'll bounce around all over the place. I'll have like the first set of topics and then I'll just bounce to the end. <laughs> Then I'll go to the middle, and about a third of the way through, and then flow the conversation, you know. That's why it's good having it in your head. And, and it melts the conversation flow. You also have some stock bridges and um, to get back to the main focus of the interview, because some people can just go off and talk about something completely unrelated, and you need to get the corral and back in to the main focus of the discussion. Um, for instance, I'll say, oh, that was it. what you were saying there is interesting, you know, um, I wonder if you could tell me a bit more, you know, you were talking about X earlier, I wonder if you could tell me a bit more about that, just try and bring them back, yeah? Um, so, you know, have some sort of bridging ideas. Difficult interviews. You know what I'm... few stories to tell on this one, but anyway, um, why is the difficult interviews? I mean, there's, there's, there's a numerous reasons for this, and they're, to be honest, they're usually out of your control. Um, office morale may be low after a series of redundancies in, in the organisation. There might be an issue, there might be an issue, the interviewee might be having, might be just having a bad day, you know? We get it. Um, there may be a significant issue going on in the workplace that you're not aware of. This means that you know your, your interviewers could be just quite care in the responses, or you have your interviews cut short. You know, I mean, sometimes it can be a bit. You know, it can be really, really. It can be. It can be difficult getting information out of people. Um, Unless it's, you know, if it's evidently apparently that there's something wrong, then, tr then try and rearrange the interview, um, if it's just not happening. Um, it'd be better to stop and rearrange the interview. <laughs> but other things, if that's not the case, um, put your more challenging questions when the interviewer may be, which the interviewer, you know, might be not so keen on answering, in the middle of the interview. And um, at this point, you'd have built up a bit of a rapport, yeah? So if you've got any things that you might think, you know, 
oh, here's a bit of a challenge for the, for the person in front, you know, because you might know X or Y about the, the, the organisation, or you know that there's, there's, there's a new policy they've got to implement and nobody's making a good fist of it, and, and, and so, you know, <laughs> it's, it's going to be a touchy subject. There must things like that are touchy subjects. So, you know, try and put them in the middle of an interview when you've got a bit of a, bit of a rapport. Um, and I usually preface it with something like, well, actually, uh, this is a different question to answer, but I'd really like, you know, if you could give me a view on fun, 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 fun. Yeah? The other thing as well is what you'll find is, and race the head, but the other thing you'll find is that sometimes with, with elite interviews particularly, what you will find is they will, they will answer the question, but it's not the question you've asked. They're answering something. As I said, these people are usually still communicating, yeah? They'll answer, they'll answer a completely different question, not the question you've asked. Why? Because the question you've asked is the question they really don't want to answer. So in situations like that, what might be a good, a, a good tactic is you break the question down into bite-sized parts. So you get your answer in parts. Or you rephrase it slightly. Or you do both. So you will get the answer out of them. It's a bit sneaky, but you know you will get the answer out of them one way or another. So that happens, you know, that does happen every now and again where people just give the answers, you know, to the questions that you haven't asked. So just to wrap up then, and ending the interview, as I say. These people are busy um, when you come to end an interview, and just when you're getting near to the end, just say, I've just got a couple of quick questions, you know. And this, this comes in, especially when you've, you've walked through the door and went, I'll give you half an hour. <laughs> so, you know, reassure them that the interview is coming to end. Other things like when you're in interviews, you know, the telephone, I mean, you get this all quite a lot, you know, the telephone can ring. So it's, you know, just pause your recording, whatever, stop the interview, and get them to answer it unless they don't want to, you know. Someone comes in the room, you know. Um, to deal with a query, you know, this type, these sort of things tend to happen a lot, you know. Just keep it out where you are on your, on your interview schedule or your topic guide. Um, and, and things like that will happen. So, and also try to, um, after the interview, the other thing was talking about snowballing earlier, yeah? Try to get any further contacts. Um, and, you know, who would be good to talk to, etc., etc. Try and get them. They'll probably put you in touch with uh, the executives of the PA, etc. Who will we'll probably sort all that out for you. you know, so try and do your snowballing. Find out you know, who else do I need to talk to. Because as I said, you know, some people are very visible. So you may suddenly say, oh, you need to speak to X. Who's X? You know, who's X? And it's the, the not on the internet bit again. You know? So you need to do that. So just to wrap up then, some main points just to take away. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no one size fits all approach to interviewing elite subjects. You know, of course, that makes the point there. There isn't. Um, and the research subject, the personality, the interview, and the interviewee, as well as the location, time, and context of the interview, should, to a large degree, shape you know individual approaches of how you can tackle them. Um, and Harvey cites Richards who says, in short, there is a lack of academic guidance concerning pilot work on elite members. And as I say there, Harvey suggests at the end of the field research, if you're new to elite interviewing, it might be an idea, you know, to sort of perhaps schedule them near the end of your, of your, of your um, research schedule rather than at the beginning, you know. Um, if you're a bit nervous about it or whatever, you know, you haven't gone interview, you know, some chief exec or director or MP or any. Get a few interviews on the belt of other people if you're really concerned about it. Um, I mean, Harvey says, you know, these people don't suffer fools gladly. Oh, it's not quite that bad. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, so also, as I said, do your homework, yeah? And find out all you can about the organisation and the person that you're going to be interviewing because. Otherwise, you can look a bit silly if you don't. <laughs> um, 
and met the interview. I can't stress enough, met the interview a conversation. Don't make it seem like it was a bit. Let it a conversation.